Well, praise the Lord. Amen. This is a day that the Lord hath made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. Even when um, we don't like what the preacher has to say. <laughs> I have just such a blessed message for you all today. That's scary. I remember, that's scary. I remember one time I was getting a picture taken and they said smile and I went. <laughs> it's the closest thing I could get to a smile at that point. Amen. Listen, we welcome or we're thankful for everybody that's here. Praise God. Amen. We love you being here. We, we're thankful for the folks that are on the internet. Um, if you're on the internet, like us. That helps us out a little bit. And, and, if, and if you can't listen, then don't listen. Don't, don't tune in for 10 seconds and then tune off because that hurts us. It, the, that biorhythm hurts. It doesn't help. Um, so anyway, we appreciate you coming. We appreciate you listening. Uh, turn in your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 15. 1 Peter 1, 15. It says, there's still people turning, so I'm going to pause for a minute. It says, but as he which hath called you is holy... So be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Now, conversation isn't talking. Conversation is every aspect of your walk in your life. Amen. Verse 16, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, this is a message, Lord, that uh, I think is very needful for the time. I need your help. I need your power from on high to preach it. We certainly live in a time period where people don't want to hear this type of message. They're going to want to tune it out. They're not going to want to listen to it. But God, this is absolute truth. And Lord, I pray that you just pave the way that your Holy Spirit would touch the heart of each person that's going to listen, whether now or later on on the internet. I just pray that you touch the hearts of those that are going to listen. And let it be a true time of reflection. For them to consider where they're at and what they're about and what they're doing and how their service is to you and whether or not they're holy. Your word commands us to be holy because you're holy. Lord, this message, take time to be holy. It comes straight from this book and straight from your spirit. So, Lord, help me to say it in truth. Help me to say it in a way that it can be received. And, Lord, we just love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know what? God always expects us to be holy. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, we'd have to say we're not always holy. But God's expectation is that we'll always be holy. He is our Father and he wants us to live up to his name. I talked about being raised in the day household. My dad made a point to talk to us kids. He had three boys. And he made it a point to talk to us boys. You're carrying the day name. Don't tarnish it. You're carrying the day name. That means something. We have a specific character. And, we, and my expectation as your father is that you will live up to that character. Be honest in your business dealings. Your handshake is your bond. If you commit something to somebody and then later on find out that it wasn't to your best advantage, you go through with it because your word is your bond and you live up to that name that has been given to you. That's an earthly father. We have a heavenly father. And that Heavenly Father says, I have a name. And I've given my name to you the very minute that you got saved. And I expect you to be holy because I am holy. That's God, not me saying that. And so your, His expectation of you, and it goes so contrary to what preachers preach today. You don't hear preachers preaching about the requirement for you to be holy. Now, I want to clarify what I mean by requirement because it's not a requirement to salvation. You can't be holy enough to get yourself saved. You can't do it. Can't do it. Wouldn't be prudent, as George Bush used to say. <laughs> 
You got to rely on God's holiness for your salvation. Amen. But then when you get saved, you know what? You have an advantage over every other human being that's not saved on this earth. You have a it's not a religious thing, folks. It's not a religious thing. And you have as a true Christian somebody that believes that Jesus Christ is God and has proclaimed that Jesus Christ is God and they believe that he died and was buried and rose again the third day, that, per, that is what defines a Christian. Your walk doesn't define you. You should walk right, but that doesn't define you. There's people that have an excellent character and they are probably more holy than a lot of Christians, but they've never come to a point where they confess that Jesus Christ is God and they never come to a point where they believe in their heart that he died and was buried and rose again the third day, and they're as lost as a goose. Mm -hmm. And they think they're going to be fine because I live a good life. I'm a man of my word. I have integrity. I have character. And if they die without confessing that Jesus is God and without believing that he rose again the third day, I don't care how good a life they live, they're going to hell. Yeah. And so, when I talk about there's an expectation or requirement to be holy, I want to make it very, very clear. I'm not saying that you have to be holy to be saved because you can't be holy enough to be saved. Your salvation is based on the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood that He shed to save your wicked soul from hell. The truth be told, when we judge somebody and we look at somebody and we judge them to be a righteous person, we look through our eyes and our eyes don't see the truth. The Bible says, talking about human beings, that our righteousness is as filthy rags. So you look at somebody and you say, boy, they're righteous. No, they're not. Their righteousness is as filthy rags. But we have an advantage as those who have proclaimed that Jesus is God and believe that he rose again the third day. We have an advantage over every other person in the world because we now have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within us. God. Now, we can ignore that Holy Spirit. We don't have to follow his leading. We can, God gives us a free will even as Christians to do whatever you want to do. Now, as a preacher, I've heard people say all kinds of things. Well, I don't believe you can do this and be saved. Salvation's not based on whether you do that or whether you don't do that. Salvation is based on you confessing that Jesus is God Amen. and believing that He rose again the third day. <coughs> Ted Bundy was a terrible human being. Comes from the Bundy family. Now, there's been a lot of people that have tried to prove because the Bundy family is part of the Illuminati with the Rothschilds and the, they're, they're, and the um, you know, there's multiple families, but the Bundy family is one of them. Now, nobody's been able to prove that Ted Bundy was one of the Bundy family, but you know what the Illuminati has in common? They're all Satanists. They all believe in torturing people and human sacrifice. And you go, preacher, that's way out there. Well, it is. It's way out there, but it's still true. Just because it's way out there doesn't mean it isn't true. <laughs> and you look at the things that Ted Bundy did to those women and it fits right in with that satanic lifestyle. But you know what they say? They say he got saved before he was executed for the things that he did. Now, I, I'm not a preacher that believes in jailhouse conversion. But his conversion does appear on the surface to be a real conversion because he didn't say, okay... I got saved now and I'm a whole new person so you should suspend my sentence and let me out of jail because now I'm a Christian and I love Jesus. He didn't do that. When he got saved, he said, I'm a new person, but the actions and the things that I did demand that I give what I got. <laughs> and he went to his execution willingly without fighting about it because he said, I deserve this. That sounds like Real conversion, not jailhouse conversion. But listen, that's not the point. The point isn't whether Ted Bundy is saved or not saved. The point is, even with the wicked things that he did, if he confessed that Jesus is God and believed that he rose again the third day, he's with Jesus right now. 
despite all the things that he did. People have a hard time with that. People have a hard time with that. They don't want to believe somebody that did that could be saved. But don't you see? The Bible says that if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you're guilty of all. If you took the name of the Lord thy God in vain, you're guilty of the whole law. The whole law. What's that mean? Murder, adultery, <laughs> idolatry. Mm -hmm. How many laws do you have to break to be a lawbreaker? One. One, amen. Nobody is in hell because of raping somebody. Nobody is in hell because of being a fornicator. Nobody is in hell for being a drunkard. Mm -hmm. Nobody's in hell for any sin that you want to imagine in your mind, there's one thing that takes somebody to hell, the sin of unbelief. God came down to this earth in the form of a human being, put off his deity and said, let me be a human and see what these things that I created go through. And he took on the form of a man and the Bible says he was tempted in all things like we are. All things. He was tempted with women, with booze. With, the Bible says in all things he was tempted like we are, yet without sin. Amen. He never fell. And I think one of the things that we're going to regret the most is when we get to heaven and we find out it was possible for us to do that. It was possible for us to be sinless. We chose not to. And that fits right in with the message because it's possible for you to be holy. Jesus doesn't make a commandment of you that's not possible. And he said, be ye holy because I'm holy. You now have my name. I've adopted you as a child of mine. And this name is something to live up to. So you need to be holy because I'm holy. You're carrying my name. Amen. Amen, preacher. Amen. He is our Father. He wants us to live up to His name and this is very important to Him. Why? Because there's so great a crowd, a cloud of witnesses that are watching every move that we make. It's so important that, that the exact phrase, be holy, that exact phrase, be holy, appears in your King James Bible 39 times. 39 times. You're exhorted to be holy. Be holy. Be holy. Be, I should go through 39 times so you can see how many times be holy is said when it's said 39 times. You're supposed to be holy. Now, you know I'm a King James guy. Why is that? Well... The New Living Translation only uses the term 26 times. Wow. Took away about a third of the times that God said be holy. Must not be too important to those translators. Amen? Yeah. The NIV only 25 times. Maybe the folks that translate it, of course, when the one of the uh, people on the translate, translation committee is a practicing lesbian, they don't work. That person's not worried about being holy. Amen? Amen. It's in the ESV 31 times. Well, that's better, but it's still not matching the King James. Amen? Mm -hmm. It's in the Christian Standard Bible 32 times. Almost every new version reduces the number of times that God commands us to be holy. There's one exception. There's one Bible that says 39 times be holy the new King James Version because that is Satan's work of art. Satan took that Bible and he, and he recognized where all the King James folks were able to point out where those Bibles were inaccurate and he didn't do the same thing in the new King James. There's other places where the new King James is not accurate but it's not as simple as just saying all the new versions got rid of this, all the new versions got rid of that. Amen. Because it's his work of art. The New King James is a satanic Bible, but it's, it's. Matter of fact, if you look at the cover, the emblem on the New King James is 666. 666. Huh. 
But the fact that they remove these things about being holy, it just goes right along with the times we live in. Amen? Yeah. Because they don't care anything about being holy. Come to our church. We'll serve you beer while you worship God. Is that being holy? No. You know, you, I, I would say that even the people that argue that social drinking is A-OK -okay would not dare to say that serving alcoholic beverages in church is a holy thing to do. Hmm. Today, most churches have absolutely no expectation of holiness. They'll say blasphemous things from behind the pulpit. Preachers that say, I am God. You're not God. Some even go as far as say, I am God Almighty. There's this little God theology out there now that says, God Almighty is the big God, and because we're His kids, we're all little gods. And that's not biblical. That's nonsense. You're not even going to be an angel someday. You are a human being. And then when you go to heaven, you'll go to heaven. You'll be as the angels. The Bible says you'll be as. It doesn't say you'll be an angel. But it says you'll be as the angels. You'll be in that realm. You'll be in the spiritual realm that we can't see. Listen, folks. As I'm preaching, there's a spiritual battle going on all around us as I'm preaching. Demonic forces against godly forces. And praise the Lord, if you pray up and you're, and you're trying to do God right, the godly forces will always overpower the demonic forces. Plead the blood of Jesus Christ. I know Christians that were in their home and were attacked by demons. I mean physical attacks, being thrown around, being bruised up, being beat up. And those Christians, when they're smart enough to say... I plead the blood of Jesus Christ in the name of the Lord God Almighty. Leave my house immediately. And you know what happens? It turns to calmness just like that. <laughs> because the godly forces are more powerful than the demonic forces. You notice when Jesus came across anybody that was had a demon in him, and Jesus oftentimes when he saw the demon started communicating, talking with the demon, not the person. The demon never said, oh, good, you're here. Now we can finally have the battle that we've been waiting for. I'm going to fight you. No, most of them say, I know who thou art, the Most High. Have you come to torment me before my time? They know they're going to lose. Mm -hmm. Have you come to torment me before my time? Time. We talked about time in Sunday school, amen? Time. Well, we're talking about holiness. What does the word holy even mean? What does it mean? Words are important. Amen. Mm -hmm. The word holy has an extensive definition. It's the, the word, and I'm going to quote the first, there's numerous definitions, but the first definition is this. Properly, whole, entire, or perfect in a moral sense. Hence, Pure in heart, temper, or dispositions. Free from sin and sinful afflictions. Applied to the supreme being. Holy signifies perfect, perfectly pure. Wow. That's pretty high ground, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Immaculate and complete in moral character. A man is more or less holy as his heart is more or less sanctified. As you allow God to sanctify you, what does sanctification mean? Set apart, separated from the world. The more you allow God to sanctify you, the holier you will be. It's that simple. But see, we have a free will. We don't have to let God sanctify us. We don't have to allow God to separate us from the world. We can embrace the world. We can be in love with the world. We can do all the things that the world does even when we know they have evil connotations to them because we have a free will. And our flesh, although it's dead, still lives. If that doesn't, that, that's confusing, but it's a true statement. The Bible says, when I got born again, my old man died and now I'm a new man raised unto newness of life. And yet, when that old man died, he didn't have a do not resuscitate sign on him. 
and I keep running over and resuscitating that old booger, mm -hmm. and I keep letting him do things through me which I wouldn't do, and the Apostle Paul was in the same boat because he said, the things that I would do, I don't do, yeah. and the things that I wouldn't do, that's exactly what I find myself doing. Because the old man still jumps in there. But that old man truly is dead because Paul went on to say, so now when I do the things that I wouldn't do, it's no longer me that does them. I'm a new creature. It's sin that dwelleth in this nasty body. We're going to get a new body when we get a resurrected body. It won't be this nasty, sinful body. You know, all these old man marks that are showing up on this old man's body, you know, the, the little skin blemishes that old people get, the, the, I think they call them liver spots. I don't know if they are even connected with the liver, but I think I got a couple up here on my head, and I've had skin cancer removed a couple, two, two or three times. I've had to go in and have skin cancer removed. And um, that's because this old, rotten, nasty body, this sinful body, but someday I'm going to be given a glorified body. Amen. And it's not going to have any of those old man ailments. I have a really bad back and sometimes when I'm preaching it's like, oh, my back's killing me. I'm, I'm going to get rid of that bad back. I'm going to be given a glorified body that doesn't have a bad back. Amen, brother? Amen. <laughs> the second definition of holy. Oh, by the way, uh, in the first definition, it says holy is used as nearly synonymous with good, pious, and godly. The second definition of, of and, and also they use, this is a Webster's 1828 dictionary. They also use our text of 1 Peter 1.16 as a demonstration of holiness. Second definition of holiness, hallowed. You know, the Lord, when he taught the, the apostles how to pray, he says, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. <laughs> so holiness has a connection to hallowed. Consecrated or set apart to a sacred use. Boy, that's significant, isn't it? A sacred use or to the service or worship of God. A sense frequent in Scripture as the holy Sabbath, holy oil, holy vessels, a holy nation, the holy temple, and the holy priesthood. You say, well, preacher, you're in the holy priesthood. You know who's in the holy priesthood? Everyone. Every Christian. We are all priests before God. The Bible says that you as a Christian should always be able to give an account for what you believe. And that doesn't mean that you go to somebody and say, well, my preacher said. You know what you do? You go to him and you say, thus saith the Lord. And you show him what the Bible said. You say, well, I don't know what the Bible says, so I don't talk to people. Well, then you're not being very holy. That's the truth of it. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen, preacher. Amen, 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 amen. Third, third definition. <laughs> Proceeding from pious principles or directed to pious purposes, such as holy zeal. Paul talked about a group of people, they have a zeal without knowledge. <laughs> Zeal can be good, but zeal's not necessarily good. You can have, you can be zealous for the wrong things. And you see that all the time in sporting events. You know, it's 15 degrees outside, and here's a bunch of fat guys like me out bare belly with their skin painted orange and blue going, go Denver, go Denver. And then they look at us and say, I can't go to church. You guys are too fanatical. Yeah, sure do. Fourth definition, perfect, just, and good, as in the holy law of God. Fifth definition is sacred as a holy witness. Holy, holy, be ye holy. Be you perfect, complete, set apart, sanctified. Sanctified, separated. Don't do the things the world does. Don't do the things the world does. So I guess I should also define holiness. If I'm going to define holy, I should probably also define holiness. First definition of holiness. Applied to human beings, holiness is purity of heart or dispositions. Sanctified. Oops, there's that sanctified. Nasty word, that sanctified is a nasty, nasty word. Set apart. You know, God says that the person that's a friend of the world is his enemy. God doesn't like this world. That's why we're not supposed to be part of this world. God doesn't like this world. 
Wait a second, preacher. God loves every everything. Like, get in your Bible. Don't you know? Don't irritate me with your ignorance of the Bible. God does not love everything. God does not even love every human being. Get in your Bible and read. Amen. Holiness is purity of heart or disposition, sanctified affections, piety, uh, moral piety. Excuse me, not piety. Piety, moral goodness, but not perfect. We see piety and holiness ridiculed as morose singularities. That's what Noah Webster said. Amen. Second definition, sacredness. The state of anything hallowed. The consecration to God or His worship applied to churches or temples. Holiness. Holiness. Third, that which is separated to the service of God. Are you separated to the service? Just being a Christian doesn't mean you're separated to the service of God. Are you separated to the service of God? Do you reject the things of the world that the world clings on to? Are you afraid of the world? Are you afraid that if you don't get on board with what they're doing, that they're going to scorn you and abandon you and leave you? You're not supposed to be afraid of that. You're supposed to fear God and not the world. Churches today see absolutely no value in being set aside to holiness. Amen. They reject doctrine, which means they reject the Bible. You know what doctrine means? Teachings. So when you say, I reject doctrine, you're rejecting the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what happens when you reject the Old Testament? You're rejecting the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning. They don't see any value to being set apart or to being holy or to exercise holiness. In fact, they teach, they think, that just the opposite is good. Don't be holy. Be what you will. Do as thou wilt. That is the whole of the law. Satanic. Yes. It's Satanism. They believe that if they lay aside holiness, they'll be able to grow the church more effectively. Well, it depends on what your definition of growth is. If you're talking about more butts in the chair, yeah, you'll grow more effectively because if there's no talking about holiness, it's easy to attend your church service because it never goes against the flesh. If you're talking about raising mighty soldiers, which the Bible says we are when we get saved, if your idea of growth is raising mighty soldiers to get in the battle for God, then rejecting holiness has just the opposite effect. You wind up with a bunch of anemic, lazy, pathetic, non-godly, and I'm not even going to call them Christians. I think most of them aren't Christians. They just go to church to get their... Uh, the, you know, every human being is created with this void inside of them, and that void is the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so people search their whole life to fill that void. Some think it's in cars. So you got guys like Jay Leno who buy all these this huge car collection of real fancy cars, and that void's never filled because even if he has a hundred rare cars, he's looking for the next one because the void's not filled. There's only one thing that will fill that void. Now the preachers, I think that most of the preachers in these churches that ignore holiness, these churches that that um, take the opposite approach, I think most of them aren't saved and I think most of them know that they're working for Satan and not for God. I would say that most of them are satanic and they know they're satanic. And they're misleading as many people as they possibly can because that is their mission. They're zealous for their God and their God is Satan. Yes. Preacher, that's pretty harsh. Yeah, I know. But it's the truth. They believe that laying aside holiness makes their church grow more effectively. And I guess 
that depends on your definition of effectively. If you're talking about converting people to true Bible believers who want to serve God in the spirit and in truth, then they're going to fail the test of effectiveness. There's nothing effective in what they're doing as far as pleasing God. Amen? Amen. Now, there's a very funny thing about holiness. It's, it's really peculiar. And that is, most people think they're holy. <laughs> And they're not. The devil convinces them that everything is all right. And while most people buy into the law, I'll admit there's some people who know that they are evil, but the exception proves the rule. Most people think they're righteous, think they're holy. And I'm going to show you some Bible. Look at Proverbs 30, verse 12. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 12. Bible says there is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness that's people people look at themselves and they say man I'm good women get and men do too I shouldn't say women but they look in that mirror and they say man I'm hot <laughs> I'm good who wouldn't want to be with me I'm everything well, there's this big movement to love yourself these days. Yeah. You can't love anybody else until you love yourself. Most people love themselves, whether they want to say it or whether they don't want to say it. Look at Isaiah chapter 5, verse 21. Isaiah 5, 21. It's just over a few pages, actually. Isaiah 5, 21. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. See, God recognizes that propensity in human beings. They think they're good. Woe unto them. Woe unto them. They look at themselves and say, man, I've got this thing under control. I'm good. Woe unto them. Look at Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 13. Ezekiel 33, 13. Man, we don't stand a prayer getting through this today. Ezekiel 33, 13. When I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trust in his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousness shall not be remembered, but for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. So God's saying, I'm not going to recognize your righteousness from your own eyes. That's not my righteousness. That's not my holiness. You're self-righteous. Look at Romans. You say, that's all Old Testament. Old Testament's the Bible, folks. Look at Romans chapter 10, verse 3. Romans chapter 10, and verse 3. The Bible says, For there... They being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. You see, here's a, here's a solid truth that's hard for us to get a hold of. It doesn't matter what you think is right. It doesn't matter what you think is okay. It doesn't, Preacher, I just don't see anything wrong with it doesn't matter whether you see anything wrong with it or not. What matters is what this book says. Why is it that everybody that comes to the preacher always has some questionable thing? Well, preacher, I just don't see anything wrong with social drinking. Well, that's because you don't want to see anything wrong with social drinking. Social drinking is a sin. It can cause a brother to fall. If you do it on a regular basis, it will impact your liver. And it's a holy temple of God that you're impacting. Well, preacher, I just don't see anything wrong with watching TV as long as you don't watch too many R-rated movies. 
Well, it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you think. Your evaluation of what's righteous and holy is skewed by your own filthy self. I can give you several more. But the Bible says in Matthew 18, 16, you don't have to turn there. The Bible says, but if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Now, I realize doctrinally this is talking about church discipline. If a brother has an issue with a brother or a sister with a sister, they're supposed to first go to that brother by themselves and try and work it out. If they can't work it out, they go and they get a witness. And the, they work it out. And if they can't work it out, eventually it goes before the whole church. Mm-hmm. And if they still can't work it out, if the guilty party refused to see it, because they keep saying things like, well, I just don't see anything wrong with, the whole church separates from that person. But there's a principle that's being taught in this that's a, it's a consistent principle throughout the Bible, and that is at the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. That's, this isn't the only place that God uses that term. And that's why uh, I'm pointing out that I gave you four witnesses from the Word of God that tells you you think you're holy when you're not holy. You think you're righteous when you're not righteous. You think you're good when you're bad. The precedence, the precedence that's being set there in Matthew is the idea that the mouth of two or three witnesses establishes something. And that concept is repeated with different texts. Look at Deuteronomy 17.6. I'm going to give you multiple witnesses on this concept as well. Deuteronomy 17.6. says, at the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. It takes more than one witness to establish something, folks. Now I've given you two witnesses that say that it takes two or more witnesses, amen? Go over to Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin in any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. There's a principle that God's telling us. And this applies to Bible study. There's people that find one verse in the Bible and they want to build a doctrine out of that one obscure verse and that's the only witness they have. And the Bible says one witness doesn't establish a matter. If you're going to have a doctrine, you need to be able to find witnesses within the Word of God that testify to that doctrine that you're trying to teach. And that's what I'm doing right now. Look at 2 Corinthians 13.1. 2 Corinthians 13.1. This is the third time, Paul's talking to the church of Corinth. This is the third time I am coming unto you in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So Paul's going to a church, which is a very carnal church, filled with baby Christians who don't want to grow in the Lord. They're more concerned about speaking in tongues than they are about knowing their Bible. And Paul's letters to them are rebukes. And Paul says here, this is the third time that I'm coming to you and this time I'm going to have witnesses because you refuse to yield to the biblical truths that I'm telling you. Amen? Amen. So we have this principle that at the mouth of two or three witnesses a thing can be established. I showed you four witnesses and I can show you more, but I showed you four witnesses where people think they're right, people think they're holy and they're not. That means you think you're holy about some things and you're not. I showed you the four. And on top of that, I showed you four witnesses that prove that people uh, have a very favorable outlook on their own righteousness. 
And now we're going to look at Galatians 6.1. Look at Galatians 6.1. Galatians 6.1. Brethren. Now, I've, I've preached on this verse before. I'm not going to go into a great dissertation on this. But it says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. We might look at this again as we go through this, because this is going to end up, I can see that we're going to run out of time before I even get through today, so it's going to wind up being a series on holiness. <laughs> The average Christian looks at this verse and when they see that phrase, ye which are spiritual, they go, that's me. Because <laughs> they think they're good. They think they're right. And if you look at that and say, that's me, you probably can't fit the bill because it says in a spirit of meekness. And if you're all puffed up thinking that's you. Now a better approach would be Gosh, Lord, I don't know if I measure up. I'm willing to try, but I don't know that I can fit the view, the, the, the requirement. And this creates a huge mess when dealing with doctrine. I said ever since the very first service of this church that the Bible is going to be our final authority. I'm not the final authority. You're not the final authority. Um, some person that comes in here and speaks something that none of us understands not the final authority. The Bible is the final authority. There's a heavy uh, requirement when you're going to pick a name that says Bible Believers Community Church. That kind of comes in the, at a, at, with a cost to it. See, Satan doesn't want, especially if you truly are a Bible believer, when we picked the name Bible Believers Community Church, everybody in the church said, Amen, that's the name for our church. Yeah. <laughs> Yet when push came to shove, the original people weren't even Bible believers. The ones that are gone now. Because when you start preaching truth from the Bible and you use the Bible to define it, you know what you never see me do? You never see me pull one verse and say, now here's what this means and, and this is the way we're going to go because I tell you what this means. No, I always compare Scripture with Scripture. And it's hard to say that it's not coming from the Word of God when you're letting Scripture define itself. Amen? But people have been told so many lies that when you start telling them biblical truth, they go, whoa, Nelly, I've never heard that before. That's not how it's been taught to me. They don't even reference the book. That's not how it's been taught to me. Okay, well, I understand that. There's a lot of apostate churches out there. But I'm showing you Bible. Maybe, just make, brace yourself, maybe, just possibly, you've been taught wrong. And now I'm trying to show you the truth. Here's the problem. We start following somebody and we really enjoy them. We come to realize that they have a far deeper understanding of the scriptures than most people, than most preachers even. Amen? We follow them on the internet, we watch them on Facebook, we subscribe to them on YouTube. They teach us something that we've never seen before and it makes so much sense. The problem is somebody else comes along and shows you that this person made a mistake and they use the Bible to show you that they're wrong. That causes a little bit of a conflict. That causes a little bit of a problem. It causes a little bit of discomfort. They misunderstood something or they downright wrestled with the scriptures to make it say something that it doesn't say at all because everybody is prone to doing that. I try and be very careful. I give my opinion sometimes and what do I always say? This is my opinion. Be careful with it. It's not Bible. 
So they misunderstood something or they downright wrestled it to make it say something that it didn't say at all. And we reject the second person that comes and shows us something out of the Bible because we love this other person so much, the first person, the one that we've been following. Oh, how could they be wrong? How could they possibly be wrong? They're such a great man of God. <laughs> and in this day and age, she's such a great woman of God. There's no such thing as a woman preacher. I'm sorry, Amen. folks. We're going to get into that later, but we're not going to get into it right now. But this idea of rejecting what the Bible says to the person that we We've been following. This is exactly what Romans 2.15 is talking about. Turn to Romans 2.15. Look at 14 for context. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or excusing one another. Now, there's people that read that and they don't let that sink in on what it's saying. You know what that's saying? You get caught in something. Somebody says you're doing this wrong and they show you some Bible. And you may say, yeah, but at least I'm not doing this. And you throw something. You're excusing yourself and you're accusing the guy that gave you a rebuke. That's wrong. That's wrong. In business, I used to have this illustration that I would give. And it's a pretty graphic illustration, but it makes a really good point. And it accentuates this verse. You go up to somebody and you say, let's talk about your walk with the Lord. What do you think about your walk with the Lord? And they'll say, well, okay, let's just get this out in the open. I'm a social drinker. I, I have a, a cocktail every once in a while, but at, at least I've never gotten drunk. I've never been drunk. They're excusing. And at the same time, they're accusing those that do get drunk as being worse than them. They're not even dealing with the problem that they're being a social drinker. And so they go to the next person and they say, how about you? And they say, well, you know, <laughs> being we're kind of airing things out, I'm just going to say it right up front. I'm a social drinker, and every once in a great while, I take it too far, and I get drunk. Goes to the next person. How about you? Okay, I, you know, we're airing our dirty laundry. I may as well come clean. I'm a social drinker, and I pretty much get drunk every day. But at least, at least I've never passed out. The next person, well, I'm a social drinker, and I get drunk every day. I pass out once in a while, but I never black out where I don't remember what's happened. The next person says, I've done all that stuff and I've blacked out, but I've never gotten sick. Next person says, okay, I drink, I black out, I pass out, I've gotten sick, but I've never rolled over in it. Where does it end? Mm -hmm. Where does it end? Is that the measuring stick that we want to do? You see, accusing and excusing causes big problems. Because we can always find somebody that's worse than us. And that's what we do as humans. And that's not a measurement of holiness. You can find somebody that did something worse than you did, but that doesn't make you good. It doesn't make you right. It doesn't make you holy. Because holy's not, well, I'm better than him. It's kind of like going door to door and you say, have you ever sinned? Well, yeah, I sinned, but it's not like I'm Hitler. Makes sense if Hitler was the measuring stick. <laughs> but Hitler's not the measuring stick. The question isn't, are you as bad as Hitler? The question is, are you as good as Jesus Christ? Because Jesus Christ is the measuring stick. Amen. Holiness. 
we accuse the second person and excuse the first person because I mean after all that person that we listen to going back to the person that we're following we accuse the second person oh he's a legalist oh he's being judgmental we accuse them and we excuse the guy that taught wrong because we've been following him and we like him and how in the world could he be wrong Do you ever wonder why I frequently say, I don't want you taking my word for anything. Check it out. Look it up for yourself. Study it out for yourself. Don't take my word for it. I've made mistakes. You've made mistakes. Whenever I preach something that doesn't line up with this word, I am 100% absolutely wrong. No excuses. When you accept something that's contrary to this word, you are absolutely wrong. No excuses. But the Bible tells us you'll make excuses. <laughs> and you'll accuse other people so that you don't look so bad. Excusing and accusing. Yeah. I fully understand that I can be wrong. I understand that. that's why I'm guarded. I know I can be. I'm not... I'm a human being. I'm a person just like you're a person. I'm not infallible. I know that I can be wrong. I've been wrong before. And you know what I do when that happens? When I get up and preach something and I find out what I preached is wrong? Most preachers say, never going to embark upon that subject again. It may have nothing to do with where the church is right now. I may have preached it three months ago, but if I find out it was wrong, before I start my next sermons, I say, folks, i got to clarify something. I taught this, and I just, through study, found out that that's not accurate. Let's see what the Bible says. Hmm. Take time to be holy. Fess up to your mistakes when you're wrong. Allow God to do a work in you. I found errors in preachers who are far smarter than I am. I found errors in preachers that are far holier than I am. I have found errors in preachers who I really believe are much closer to God than I am. Being close to God doesn't mean that you're absolutely perfect. You still can make mistakes. You know what I do when I, do, when I see that? You know what most people do? Oh, he taught something that's wrong. I'm never going back to that church again. No, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You say, he's wrong there and I can show him. And you know what you have a responsibility to do? If you can show in the Bible where I teach something that's wrong, your responsibility is make an appointment with me and come educate me out of the Bible because you may have received something that I haven't received. And then I have the opportunity to go and set it straight with the people. And I've had that happen where I'm like, no, brother, and I show them where they're wrong through the Bible. Hmm. See, I realize that every human being is fallible, and I sure wish everybody could get that. That's why I tell you over and over again, if you're putting your confidence in me, I'm going to let you down. I'm a human being. Catholics think the Pope is infallible. They're wrong. We're out of time. We're going to pick up with this infallibility. Um,